All right. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming out today um, on this uh, chilly evening uh, that we're experiencing. We're very happy today uh, to welcome Professor Garen Malloy of Daito Bunka University in Saitama, Japan, uh, an institution that I believe is celebrating its 100th anniversary this year. Um, Garen is a very accomplished scholar of all things related to Japanese military and Japanese security. Um, after completing his undergraduate at the University of Dundee uh, and his PhD uh, at the University of Newcastle, uh, he's been working in Japan for quite a while, about oh, 30 years, yeah. uh, just about, um, and has published a really excellent book, one of the best I've ever seen, actually, on the Japanese military called Defenders of Japan, the Post-Imperial Military, uh, 1946 to 2016, um, out last year, two years ago, I believe, year and a half, year and a half ago now, uh, which I highly recommend. He gave a great talk on it over at the Faculty of Asian and Middle Eastern Studies earlier this year. Today, he's here to talk to us about the geopolitics of Japan's free and open Indo-Pacific uh, policy and strategy. So please welcome Professor Garman Lloyd. Thank you. Okay. Is this on or is this just for the camera? It's just for the camera. Okay, great. Right, I'm presuming all of you can hear me. If you do have any problems with uh, my accent, tough. Uh, but uh, uh, by the way, I have to make a couple of disclaimers at the beginning. First of all, I do tend to get quite excited when talking about Japan and Japanese security and things. So I start speaking more quickly, so it might, might, might make it difficult. And I start changing my accent a little bit. Sometimes I become more Northeast England. Uh, sometimes I actually slip into speaking Japanese when not all of the audience understand Japanese, so apologies in advance for that. Uh, another disclaimer I must say is that today I told a few friends, other visiting scholars and other people about the event this evening and I invite them to come along. And they said, oh, what's the theme? So I said, Japan's geopolitical vision for the free and open Indo-Pacific. And every one of them stared at me blankly. And I said it in English and Japanese to you know, English speakers and Japanese speakers. And all of the response was, I don't understand. What is that? It's just words. What does it mean? So I had to explain in great detail actually what the title meant, which didn't bode well for a long, dull presentation that I was going to keep you warm with. By the way, I do regard this as a social service, keeping you in a warm space. <laughs> Uh, it isn't really about education, but by the way, uh, another point, if there's anything I don't talk about that you really would like to talk about, I'm happy to talk about absolutely anything which is even tangentially linked to any of this. So without much further ado, we'll move on. The research questions. Now, scattergun approach to research questions. This is what you should never do if you are a graduate student. You should be very, very focused. But those days are long behind me, so I don't care. Um, but basically, when you start a project, and, and my project isn't focused specifically on one thing, it isn't just one thing to produce an article, to produce a book, I'm looking at it broadly in order to try and identify what could be created from it. So therefore, this is part of a creative process. So I don't need to read them out. Um, you can uh, see for yourself here. But essentially, we're looking at what is this vision that Japan has been developing and announcing. Is it a geopolitical counter to the BRI? Is it something geopolitical? Is it geostrategic? Is it all about security? Is it all about trade or economy? What is it all about? Very importantly, I think is the, the, the lower part, what forms of regional governance or partnerships is Japan seeking? So what does Japan want to get from this? What does it want to gain? particularly in relations with other states and institutions. How do partners um, engage with the Fort Vision? How, how do people engage with it? How do other countries engage with it? And essentially, what are the tangible benefits? And how free and open is Japan's vision? A Japanese lady today said to me, excuse me, you said free and open. I said, yes. She says, nothing about Japan is free and open. <laughs> Mm. Now, she does study specifically about education policy, but this is a perception within Japan. Free and open doesn't sound like the sort of like, oh, relaxed, easygoing way of Japan. 
Not quite. And finally, does Jap this is a very much a background ambient point. Does Japan think, plan, and act geopolitically? Because many people would suggest not. So if, if it is doing that now, what's happening? So anyway, the scattergun. We go down to the structure. Now, the structure, I decided to keep it very simple because my mind works that way. Uh, I'm not a great one for complex concepts. Um, so four main sections for today, just for convenience sake. Uh, the relatively boring part, I think, for most people will be the development and emergence of the vision. How did it emerge? How did it develop? I find some of it interesting but I will skip one or two things that are perhaps less interesting to most people. Then there's the geopolitical aspects of it. I'll look at a few of those, and those are specifically related to security, but other factors as well. Then there's a small part which is about visions of law and governance, and I think that because the free and open Indo-Pacific vision is specifically about values, norms, standards, using international law, essentially operationalizing international law for Japanese uh, purposes. This is important. And then the actual applications of FOIP, the sense of how the partnerships might develop. And I hope that these help provide some understanding of the context of the vision, how it emerged and developed, its ambiguities, particularly related to China. And the ambiguities related to China uh, will be dealt with in a number of parts. What is surprising to me is the coordination of the four main ministries who are managing the vision. Um, for those of you who are familiar with Japan, it's quite common to have open warfare within one ministry, let alone between ministries. But when it comes to the Fort Vision, it seems to be surprisingly well coordinated and harmonious, which is strange. It seems an anomaly to me, so that's something to look at. Um, also, connections of strategy and safety uh, and security and the relevant institutions for that. And this, over, again, an overarching element of Japan's risk management, but also contradicting its own overt norm law confirm, conformity. So we'll move on from that. Um, it is very much, the vision is very much a maritime rather than a continental vision. So... When we're looking at the BRI, there are supposed to be two aspects to it, the maritime and the continental. Japan's obviously is an island nation based upon maritime trade. Um, it is very much a maritime vision. And when we see the statements that re prime ministers have always made on Marine Day, which is in July, I believe, uh, in Japan. I should know that living there. Um, you know, this is a quote from one of them. Uh, Japan's territorial waters and exclusive economic zones, approximately 12 times the size of Japan's land area, the sixth largest maritime nation in the world. But also, increasingly, the last part, uh, the second part comes from Abe in 2013, which is Japan must demonstrate leadership in securing free and peaceful seas, transitioning from a country protected by the sea to a country that protects the sea. And within this... You can already see within one sentence, you've got elements such as trade, hints of security, but also environmental factors. And this is no accident. It is this merging of different aspects for Marine Day is fed into the Fort Vision as well. So we've got extensive maritime aspects of policy, perception of opportunity and vulnerability. Uh, we've got three post-war maritime territorial disputes with Russia, Korea uh, and China. Uh, Post-war trade security based upon the U.S. alliance and maritime safety and stability. We've got Japan's strategic dream, which is essentially to go back to about 2000. Pax Americana, globalization status quo. Obviously an unrealizable dream. And we've got maritime folk regarded as vital to Japan's prosperity, safety and security. Just for those who like to see maps and have a little bit of historical background, the three territorial disputes... With Russia, it's the Northern Territories or the Southern Kuril Islands, which you can actually see from Hokkaido. Um, the Takashima Dokdo uh, dispute is with Korea. And of course, those two, the land is occupied by the other countries. Um, and Japan is very annoyed by it, but most people in Japan don't really care. Um, and then we've got the Senkaku, which is Senkaku de Aoyu, uh, which is a conflict with, uh, sorry, dispute with both China and Taiwan. And only with the latter one, only in the East China Sea, is conflict 
likely for Japan. I'm not saying it is likely, but it has a likelihood for occurring. The South China Sea is the core of the free and open Indo-Pacific vision. But there is extensive linkage between the South and East China Seas in policy and in actuality with trade security and many other issues. Uh, but Japan, it must be remembered, has no South China Sea claims. So although there is linkage between them, it's not a territorial dispute linkage. But of course, between the two seas, we have Taiwan, which is a whole other issue which we will go into. So the emergence of the vision, this was not a sudden development. People tend to think that this was all about Prime Minister Abe, the late Prime Minister Abe. But if we go back to 2002, Koizumi Junichiro had the creation of a community across spanning the Indian and Pacific Oceans. And in 2005, came up with his arc of advantage and prosperity. There are lots of arcs and diamonds and other aspects. So, um, We've also got 2006, ta by the way, sorry, it should say Aso Taro, not Aso 2006 Taro, the Ark of Freedom and Prosperity. Um, in 2007, we've got Abe's first uh, administration, the, uh, sorry, that's, sorry, that's the wrong way around. That should be 2006 for Abe. Anyway, uh, sorry, 2006, it should be the Conference of the Two Seas, and then 2013, the second administration of Abe, that should be the bounty of the open seas. Now, all of these are very conflicted about the placement of China. Is it within or without? Is it engaged or contained? Is it flexibly hedging? What is the position of China? And something that's difficult to work out outside of Japan um, is the perception of argumentation. Not the actual creation of policy, but the perception of argumentation regarding the placement of China and any sense of strategic containment of China. This was regarded in many ways, the non-engagement with China was regarded as inherently right-wing. Very much a right-wing, extreme right-wing construct that the mainstream of Japan avoided. I know it's difficult to understand that now, but in 2002, 2005, the perception was that engagement with China was the norm. This was the mainstream norm for the LDP, the Liberal Democratic Party, the Conservative Party. How times have changed, but this is very much why the placement of China has proven difficult to manage, even for the Conservative Party in Japan. When we come through to uh, the second Abe administration, 2013, we get the National Security Strategy, which is a precursor in many ways to FOIP, with its proactive contribution to peace elements within it. But I will actually talk a little bit later about some other things which are important. What I haven't mentioned here is 2015. The Abe administration introduced some new security laws. There were revisions to other laws plus one new law. It created massive demonstrations in the street. This is war legislation. But what's interesting about that is that the uh, National Security Council and the National Security Secretariat were forbidden to use the threat of China to Japan in any of the scenarios for justifying this new legislation. And this is one of the problems that people had understanding. Why do we need this? Never was China used in any way to explain the legislation because that was considered taboo at that time, even for Abe, which is mysterious. So I was speaking to members of the National Secur Security Secretariat who were pulling their hair out. They're like, this is crazy. We have to use the examples of North Korea or evacuating Japanese from some unnamed country that wasn't very stable. So this is the, you know, the, the old story, the Alice in Wonderland world of Japanese strategic planning. But we come through to the declaration of the FORP strategy, as it was originally called in 2016, which by 2019 be called the FORP vision. And this fits around the periods of the National Defense Policy Guidelines that came out 2018 which complement and in a, some ways facilitate. The big change there was a very specific statement of defensive roles for Japan. And the defensive roles were to defer, de defer, deter, 
and defend, but also to shape the international security environment, previously seen as a very much civilian diplomatic role, not for the Ministry of Defence, not for the Self-Defence Forces. When you come up to December last year, you got the National Security Strategy, another one, and the first ever National Defence Strategy, with a much harder power focus and a much more, what we would call in IR theory, realist perspective, for the first time, I would suggest. Uh, all of these are essentially seen as being in accord with Japan's post-war principles and policies, including the Southeast Asia Maritime Focus, Article 9 of the Constitution, very flexibly interpreted, of course, and which is very much strongly against state militarization and belligerency. But clearly, with the 2022 National Defense Strategy, we've got some increasing tension with Article 9. But very much the FOIP is seen as an open platform inviting other liberal democratic state initiatives. And then we've got this. Now, this is a, an extract from an article that came out, uh, allegedly written by Mr. Abbott, on his second day of his second, published on the second day of his second administration, December 2012. Now, the language of this is very much targeting China as a threat. It's attempting to be expansionist, turn the South China Sea into a Lake Beijing, equating China with the Cold War USSR, uh, highlighting the uh, PLA Navy's aircraft carrier, scaring neighbors, coercion, Senkaku, essentially China's trying to take over the region. This doesn't fit at all with what I've already just said. So again, there's an anomaly here, a disconnect. Speaking to a different audience, speaking to an overseas audience here, rather than a domestic audience. As far as I'm aware, this wasn't translated and published within Japan. So there is a problem there. Um, there is another problem as well, which I will pick up later. But anyway, there are many problems. So, uh, sorry to take you on to, it. by the way, this was the relatively interesting part of part one. So we're now going into the relatively dull part. Um, but I do like it because this is an anomaly. The four ministries that are listed here together with the Kante, the Prime Minister's Office, National Security Council and Secretariat, and the National Police Agency have an incredibly surprising degree of harmony in their messaging and their approaches on the FOIP vision. And that also includes the three key armed forces, only one of which is a military, the Japan Self-Defense Forces. So to quickly go through, you would expect the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to be to the fore, and yes, they are. They've got five key points there, which you can see. But the first key point they have is on maritime order. Um, okay, that's fine, yeah. Maritime order, international law of the sea, fine. And the other points are fine. The latter point, maritime security and safety. Okay, fine. Um, but the concept of FOIP does not intend to create a new institution nor compete with existing institutions. Japan cooperates with any partners which share the vision of FOIP. Now, this is very much stating how it is a free and open vision, inviting other countries to create their own or complement the Japanese vision. And back in 2013, uh, sorry, 2012, in the article uh, that Abe published, which is very much anti-China, there was a specific invitation to France and Britain to return to the Indo-Pacific region and play an active security role, which seemed a bit strange at the time. But when you actually look at the Fort vision as it's developed, rather than playing an active security role as former colonial powers, if you're inviting other peoples, other countries, visions themselves of the region, it does seem to make a little bit more sense. Because Southeast Asia is clearly the fulcrum for Japan's FOIP vision, but also the FOIP visions of other countries, including the US. Um, however, uh, a Japanese scholar, Koga, has mentioned that many of the morphous statements are largely a reflection of Japan's existing policies rather than being innovations. Um, 
And the key thing here is the, the elephant in the room is that China has been largely silent on Japan's vision, except when Beijing imagines that it is being surrounded, contained, or that Japan is, as usual, reverting to its core militaristic identity, which is the usual uh, Chinese approach to dealing with Japan. MOD uh, obviously focuses on international peace cooperation activities, normally training, capacity building, and engagement. Its three key pillars we can see don't look particularly military. You know, we're looking at rule of law, freedom of navigation, free trade, pursuit of economic prosperity. This isn't a very sort of typical military approach. It's not a typical defense approach. So again, each of the ministries seems to be trying very hard to integrate with the others. It subsumes 2 plus 2 dialogues and other elements within the FOIP, including bilateral uh, relationships. And it tries to say that these are tangible achievements. But how can you have an achievement of a FOIP vision that didn't exist when this process started? That's a, an anomaly. And again, about the, the shaping the environment. Uh, METI here, we've got international public goods, looking at centrality of ASEAN. That's also in, in accord with others. The second part is, uh, so that middle part is interesting. METI's third pillar of the Fort Vision states the value of capacity building for maritime law enforcement, which isn't within its remit, but also humanitarian assistance and disaster relief, HADR, including economic salience of safety and security issues. But HADR is primarily an MOD focus. It's the self-defense forces that usually undertake it. So what we have here is security, economy, and strategy intrinsically integrated as whole of government concerns. Then we've got the MLIT, uh, which basically is engaged with this process because it administers the Japan Coast Guard, which is an incredibly large and capable body and is a civilian body, but is larger than most navies uh, and is a major collaborator with Indo-Pacific states. Um, it's also an incredibly flexible institutional vector for aid and also for anything related to the Fort Vision and projects. Uh, and because it's civilian, it's very easy for the Japan Coast Guard to link in with institutions in other countries. There's, there aren't any, or very few hang-ups uh, regarding, uh, you know, military relations. Um, and the maritime safety and security, mutual peace and prosperity at the heart of the vision for all four ministries. And that's safety and security, these expressions, Anzen Hosho and Anzen, in Japanese obviously very closely connected, but also delineated. Um, but they are constant throughout the Fort vision, security and safety. Um, and long-term investments are being made for maritime security and safety throughout the region. These date back to the days of the piracy in Southeast Asia, 1999. And the only long-standing overseas deployment, permanent deployment, uh, the Japan Self-Defense Forces and the Coast Guard have is Djibouti for the counter-piracy mission, even though there are very few pirates off the coast of um, um, Somalia anymore. Immediately forget the name of the country you're talking about. It's a bad sign. Um, but there have been uh, major defense investments for the East China Sea area, particularly the southwest down to the Nanse Shoto. So basically from Okinawa to the southwest of Japan going out into a line. There is a westward movement, but it's been gradual. It isn't a sudden thing. There hasn't been a big splurge. Again, the lack of the realist response is somewhat confusing for IR scholars. Significant naval diplomacy efforts throughout the region by both the uh, MSDF and the JCG. But the China Coast Guard is the major challenge to Japanese both sovereignty and its ocean governance capabilities around the Senkaku. And the picture on the right uh, shows that. Um, essentially, Japanese Coast Guard vessels and particularly fishing vessels have been chased away, chased around by the Chinese uh, Coast Guard. The Chinese are trying to exert their ability to um, control the islands and the waters around them. Therefore, significant risk of conflict. We've had lock-on incidents going back to 2012. And also significant uh, ECS, SCS links, Taiwan, resources, trade, uh, freedom of navigation operations, particularly by the US, not by Japan. And this issue of innocent passage. Under international law, innocent passage 
is allowed for naval vessels. Japan's interpretation of that and China's interpretation don't necessarily match. So geopolitical aspects of the Fort Vision. Um, what I would say is that Japan is addressing regional and global order transformation. And as part of that transformation, there is, not within Japan, but there is generally an increasingly ambivalent adherence to liberal internationalism. People call it the crisis of liberal internationalism. And there's a reviewed respect or, or de degradation of respect for the post-war status quo. There's a less secure U.S. hegemonic role. And trading and other blocs have emerged, such as the CPTPP. And this is all happening as part of transformation that Japan is not altogether comfortable with, clearly, because of the rise of China. So the external core of the Indo-Pacific order transformation for Japan is about Ch China's status, these points that we can see here. The PLA spending and capability enhancement is significant. It isn't just about the, uh, the PLA, but that is one of the major factors that worries Japan. Japan simply cannot match this level of spending. And we'll talk about Japanese defense spending later. Um, we've also got Chinese ambition to shape and control its surroundings, particularly the South China Sea, but as we've seen also in the East China Sea, and Chinese connections with other, whether it's North Korea, Russia, some ASEAN states, or even a country such as Mongolia, which Japan has cultivated relations with. But the internal core of the order transformation that Japan can't avoid is Japan's decline. We've got e economic flatlining, loss of the sense of progress and prosperity. We've got an aging society with a burgeoning, elderly, shrinking youth problem, the shrinking population problem. Uh, 2022, the figures aren't out yet, I don't think, but I think it's going to be about a half a million drop in the population of Japan. And the sense that Japan has got narrowing policy and strategy options. And visions of conflict for Japan, we don't normally talk about this, but there is a sense that Japan may be coming around to thinking the unthinkable, particularly regarding the East China Sea and possibly Taiwan. It, this could be regional local conflict, very limited, or regional broader conflict, regional linked conflicts, unlikely but potentially a global conflict. And then the global, uh, sorry, the conflict aspects and domains are these ideational or ideological conflicts. A trade conflict, of course, as we've seen under President Trump, but is continuing. Um, space, cyber, and electromagnetic are domains of conflict the informatic conflict, and of course, the final option which we, we do have in Ukraine is the kinetic conflict. Japan is deeply concerned by all of these um, and has often seen itself as completely ill-equipped to enter into any form of conflict except the very old-fashioned tripwire, if you invade us, we will defend ourselves. And Japan seems to be moving away from that. Minimal defense is no longer the absolute minimum of the 12 mile limit. Um, and increasingly Taiwan is seen as being within the orbit of Japan's legitimate defense interests. But we will come back to that. Uh, by the way, at the bottom, um, I just chose the last four years and I was looking at this and I was thinking, what do they signify? And I was thinking, well, 2019 is obviously Space Odyssey. 2020 is more Sakura Kawaii. 2021 is Samurai Bushido, and 2022 is, I think the intern got hold of the graphic uh, design <laughs> software and just went crazy. I, I don't really know what happened. But someone actually uh, wrote an article about the covers of, of uh, the different publications, and the 2020 and the 2021 attracted the most interest. This is Japan ch turning from its you know, cultural roots to a more military stands eyes. It's just a cover. It's just a cover. But what we can see from the top, FOIP strategy comes out 2016. But before that, we've got the national security strategy. 2019, we've got the FOIP vision that comes out. But the interplay is with the year before, with the national defense policy guidelines about shaping. But now we've got the national security strategy coming out at the same time as the national defense strategy. And it seems to be that the FOIP is mainstreamed within both. 
Now, it is very easy to mainstream something that's a vision rather than something that has concrete plans. But I think that is fairly significant, or at least more significant than the cover designs for the Defense of Japan publications. But what's also significant is that Japan is taking a whole range of initiatives and calling them part of the FORP vision. And I'm sure that you're going to read every single line that's on that uh, slide there. But essentially, some of it seems to be cooperation, some of it seems to be collaboration, but a lot of it seems to be coincidence. This stuff is happening anyway. How can it be intrinsically part of a Ford vision? This is the umbrella approach. So we've got stuff, okay, we put an umbrella over it, it covers that stuff, we give it a name. And here, it actually, you know, this is the, uh, the More for Home page, examples of Japan's efforts on the achievement of a FOIP. Okay, achievement? Really? Um, it's kind of like everything that happens in the area you throw into a bucket called FOIP and say it's a vision. Is it really policy integration or is it facilitation? Is it a coverall policy umbrella? What is clear is that most of it is held together by the sense of Japan's adherence to international law and some form of governance. But it isn't an integrated whole when you actually look at what they're trying to say are achievements as opposed to the vision and uh, the concepts behind it. So I think in terms of the geopolitical aspects, we should look at the national security strategy. Um, fairly straightforward increased identification of China and Russia as security threats and the salience of Taiwan to Japan. Increased emphasis upon international cooperation and collaboration for Japanese security as well as for regional security and continued US alliance cornerstone with increased coordination again with Taiwan relevance. But when you look at the national defense strategy this is where you see more dramatic changes and this is what's called the headlines in the past month or so. The first national defense strategy, um, it's the first, what I would say is the first truly realist response to regional threats. Realist response meaning in realism, in IR theory, increased defense threat, you would have increased defense spending. That's the normal pattern. Japan has had a lag of this. It's, it's had very slow incremental increases of spending. But what they're talking about is essentially um, pretty much almost doubling of Japan's defense spending over the next five years and increasing Japan's Coast Guard spending, which is already very large, by 40% in the same period. Um, now, the interesting thing is, and most of us are interested in tax and budgets of our own countries, they say this is going to be funded by tax increases and displacements and sale of assets which I think is completely unsustainable. The tax increases are on corporation tax and uh, tobacco tax, but the displacement they're talking about is taking half of the budget spending on infrastructure and moving it to defence. Yeah, sounds okay, except when you realise two points. Japan's defence needs a massive enhancement of infrastructure, especially in the southwest, where the infrastructure is relatively weak, Second, Japan's infrastructure, a lot of it is quite old and needs renewing for Japan's economic prosperity. So that doesn't look very sustainable. There's no increase of personnel just as well because there aren't enough people. So that doesn't look very sustainable and that's dealt with on the next slide. Eventual, prioritize, eventual functionalization of the US Alliance for Defense of Japan. Again, years in the making, uh, but no joint command system yet and not even uh, quite a joint command of all of the Japan self-defense forces and particularly no single regional command for the southwestern area. Exactly where you need an integrated command there isn't one, and there isn't going to be one. But there are addressing some defense logistical issues such as blood, oxygen, transport. They do sound like strange things to prioritize but I can go into that in more detail if you wish. Uh, but again, the blind spot of all Japanese governments, particularly the LDP, is a very limited engagement with civil society to explain why this is important, why this is essential, why people should pay more tax. The lack of engagement is astonishing. 
Um, and these are just a few uh, examples of graphs. By the way, the, the picture at the bottom is from the Global Times, the ever uh, supportive friends in Beijing, uh, showing that Japan can't handle its military spending, which there's a hint of the truth in there. So for those who don't read Japanese, uh, the bottom right over there, essentially what you've got is this is 2017, uh, 1990. This blue color here is the people of the lower ranks by age. So what you see is you normally get a large number of people in lower ranks. So as you go up, it sort of evens out. Normally, you'd expect it to cut off, but the age structure of Japan is higher. When you look at this side, this is, you know, six years ago. You don't have enough young people in lower rank positions. And the age is, is rising. And every year, they are increasing the retirement age for certain positions. So the forces are getting older. In general society, this is also an issue. If you look at Japanese population in about 95, 96, the median age was under 40. If you look at it today, the median age is almost 50. It is very much an aging society. Uh, so the forces are struggling to recruit. Always have struggled, they're gonna struggle more. On the left side, we can see relative defense spending. So it's US, UK, France, Germany, Italy, Spain, Japan. By Japanese standards, 0.95% of GDP, but by NATO standards, 1.24. And that middle one, upper one, is interesting. This is James, the defense group. That's their projection of what Japanese defense spending would be, because there was no sign that Japan was going to increase defense spending, really, by much, until this year. And although they've been talking about it, there was no plan. This year is the first time they had a plan. So that graph in the middle is totally obsolete. And geopolitical visions. Uh, we go back to Washington 2013, Japan Prime Minister. Japan is back. From where? For what purpose? We don't know. Uh, but in that speech, respect for international law was mobilized. It was mobilized for Japanese legitimacy and for strategic competition with China. South China Sea international legal issues were constantly raised with expansive PRC claims. Fiery Cross Reef, you can see at the bottom, the uh, runway there is longer than uh, the run any runway uh, in a UK civilian airport, I believe, and longer than any runway in a Japanese civilian airport. Uh, the facilities they've got there are said to be about twice the size of Terminal 5 at Heathrow. Uh, but Terminal 5 Heathrow doesn't have surface-to-air missiles, as far as I'm aware. Um, so, you know, a few issues there. Uh, East China Sea sovereignty, resource and governance issues we've talked about. Um, and this sense of the innocent passage of uh, Russia and China for surveys in the Japanese EEZ. Very much a sore point with Japan. And law and governance are very much cornerstones of the Ford vision. However, it does raise issues of Japan's adherence to these laws, particularly UNCLOS, the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea, because this far right piece of rusted concrete and something or other is the Japanese research station at Okino Torishima, bottom right. Now, Okino Torishima, Japan says, is an island capable of sustaining human life. <laughs> Hmm, okay, possibly a mermaid. Uh, but if you look at Okino Torishima on that map, Japan claims that that big round circle of 200 nautical miles is EEZ because those islands can sustain life. Under UNCLOS, no, that's wrong. So Japan is claiming that law and governance are at the core of its folk vision and its approaches to international law and yet that doesn't necessarily seem to be the case. Um, so this is a, a, a problem. The next point, the final point for this slide, is the DPRK UN Sanctions Cooperation. It's basically naval and air sanctions cooperation with minimal UN um, backing, it's got to be said. But it's essentially a coalition of the willing, and it's a coalition of those countries that say they adhere to liberal democracy, and to the post-war status quo, and are essentially Western countries. You've got Canada, France, UK, US, Australia, uh, New Zealand, Korea joining in. And it is essentially naval diplomacy in action. Japan is a legitimate security actor, a legal security actor, facilitating partner activities, 
and it's both alliance and UN buttressing. It's the perfect combination for Japan. But when we look at um, the connections of some of these disputes, oh, by the way, uh, top right there, we've got the movement of Russian and Chinese fleets around Japan, which is this innocent passage issue. Japan gets very worried by this. The Maritime Self-Defense Force is possibly the only agency within Japan that sees Russia as a continuing threat to Japan. Interestingly, the, the Air Self-Defense Force is ambivalent about the Ground Self-Defense Force, don't care. Uh, but the Maritime Self-Defense Force really do. But they are obviously worried about the Chinese and the Russians coordinating. They're coordinating air and sea movements. This is a cause for concern. But when we look at the issues of deterring or defending what or from whom, uh, North Korea comes up and, bottom right, 4th of October last year, a uh, uh, ballistic missile was fired over Japan, and the Japanese did not attempt to intercept, which I've mentioned before previously. Uh, the non-interception of a North Korean missile is important. And most people in Japan, including policymakers, don't seem to appreciate this. If you attempt to intercept it, is that an act of war? If you don't attempt to, to intercept it, are you betraying the U.S. alliance because the missile could be aimed at a U.S. base such as Guam? If you attempt to intercept and fail, what does that tell you? The, this issue of missile defense is not a simple technical issue. Your window of decision-making is very small. This missile uh, covered, I think it was 6,300 kilometers, and its total flight time was something like 20 minutes. Your window of opportunity to take action is very, very limited. Um, but when you are looking at defending or deterring against attacks upon Japan, are you actually looking at defending Japan or are you defending US bases? Uh, and what about the Japanese domains? Japanese domains essentially are all in the South China, uh, East China Sea to the southwest of Japan. So you've got Nansei, Shoto, the Senkaku, and of course, the Okino Torishima issue. And as you can see in the middle map there, uh, there's a disputed area where the Senkaku uh, are to the west of there, very close to Okinawa, and also very close to Taiwan. This is not a particularly happy, safe, stable place. But when we're looking at applications of the, for the prime partnerships, um, we ha I, I should really speed up because I've been wittering on about lots of different things. Um, so we, we have essentially this combination of uh, Japan stating that they are both reinforcing and buttressing the alliance and the UN system, which is the international system of laws. But they're also uh, considering it to be buttressing trade and economic security. And sometimes that is despite the US. Obviously, President Trump withdrawn from CPTPP it was a big uh, shock for Japan. But it's not just that. It's also this sense of securing Southeast Asia as an open arena for all countries to trade with. Very much countries such as Canada, US, Japan are looking at Southeast Asia as the future engine, as the Chinese engine possibly begins to fade away. Southeast Asia is seen as um, the next engine, as it were. And we're looking at this increasing combination. It used to be that regional security, global security, national security were three different things. And there's this sense that they are being compressed, that you, it's much more difficult to separate them. Even an issue that previously, such as Russia, having a war in Ukraine. Under Prime Minister Abe, when Crimea was invaded and occupied and made a part of Russia, the Japanese response was very mild. With the latest war, the Japanese response is much stronger. It's still mild compared to many other countries, but it is a much stronger response. So it's a convergence of regional and global aspects. Um, but also we're looking at FOIP as some sort of risk management hedging strategy. And we will come onto the concept of decentering, but not just yet. Um, sorry, I know I am producing lots of lists. This is not what you should do really when you're doing a presentation. So all graduate students don't do what I do. Um, but engaging with the folk vision, some countries, how they engage. UK and France, relatively similar rhetorical engagement, focus on trade and security. 
emphasis upon status, law, naval assets, bases, defense engagement, very vague on details and their own investments, and they have very much varying positions on China. The British position on China is particularly interesting because there are at least seven of them. And they don't seem to talk to each other uh, or even recognize each other. So the, the French position is very interesting. Stand up to China, you know, have increased bases in the Indo-Pacific area. But on the other hand, we'd quite like to sell them arms. Again, it doesn't quite fit together, but the British one is, is a stranger one. Australia, easier to understand, very much placing their FOIP vision uh, with strong commitments to the region and to the US alliance, very much a strong defense security engagement approach and concentric circles of alliance, quad, AUKUS, like the UK. Uh, and also relatively clear China position forced upon it by China targeting Australia with degrees of confrontation and also joining in South China Sea for NOPS. Canada, I will actually speak about in more detail because their vision came out only in November last year and it had no reference to Japan's uh, Fort vision at all. But it did have core engagement with uh, concepts and I'll talk about that in more detail later. Philippines. Philippines, Tokyo is a happy place for the Philippines. It's much happier than Washington. Philippines, very happy to engage with the, the Fort Vision, with Japan generally, but it's a recipient, a relatively passive country when it comes to the vision and concepts, but it has to deal with China in the front line, essentially, of the South China Sea. So when we're looking at Canada, uh, there are no Fort Vision references. Japan is referred to as a key partner. But when I spoke to uh, Canadian officials engaged in this, they said that essentially the Japan FOIP vision from 2019 was their base starting point. They very much integrated all of the concepts from Japan into their own work, even though they never mentioned the Japan FOIP vision, which is incredibly interesting to me. Um, and the, the publication was really interesting. It was published on a Sunday, which is odd, at, on the day where Canada was playing a World Cup match. It was like they were trying to hide it, but it wasn't bad news. It was good. Um, what is surprising is the level of detail. I won't bother reading it out. It's all there on the board. But they provided budget items, specific budget items for specific things which are part of their fort vision. This is very much unlike what Japan has done. Japan is like, okay, we're doing various things, put an umbrella over them. The Canadian approach is no, we're targeting certain things with budget and these constitute our achievements. Very, very different approach. Britain, by the way, uh, the British, uh, it's a very strange little island this, um, over the past decade, Japan has had three prime ministers and Britain's had three in six months. Um, and the integrated, so-called integrated review of security, defense, development and foreign policy came out. Um, it's got five references to Japan in 114 pages and none to Japan's FOIP vision. A very much fluctuating and unpredictable China policy approach, which is also confusing for Beijing. I was lucky to be able to speak to one of the first uh, Chinese scholars, but a military scholar who came over uh, at the end of November, who also came to Cambridge as well, and I know I spoke to Bill. Um, and they were confused by British policy, clearly. It has no budgets for particular targets. Emphasis upon bases in the region. It talks about Oman, Singapore, and Kenya. By the way, Singapore, the base, I think is 36 guys and they're expanding it to 42. That's their base expansion. It basically refuels ships and like supplies them with fresh water. It's scarcely what you would call a base. It's more of a filling station. Uh, very much emphasis upon defense diplomacy with some examples provided here and very much an emphasis upon the standing naval presence in the region. But when you look at the detail, this is a quotation from September last year. Two offshore patrol vessels. Now, I know that most of you are not 
like military nerds like me, but an offshore patrol vessel doesn't go very quickly, it doesn't have an integrated combat system, and it has one 30 millimeter cannon on the front. That's not exactly going to promote this Rule Britannia vision that um, these three prime ministers have been banging on about. Um, and also something that they haven't, is quite embarrassing, is that when they talk about Southeast Asia in their integrated approach, they talk very much about Indonesia, about Singapore, and about the South China Sea. Which is great. The problem is, the most important base they have in the region they don't talk about, which is in Malaya, which is the Jungle Warfare Training uh, Course, uh, which they run, and which, at the bottom there, there's the five power defence arrangement, which is supposed to be the security arrangement between Australia, New Zealand, uh, the UK, Malaysia and Singapore. They seem to be very much neglecting that, and to a degree, uh, Brunei. Um, so what is supposed to be the interaction with ASEAN and ASEAN states? Um, what are the non-military interfaces? It doesn't seem to all link up. So again, we come back to this is about Japan's folk vision and how it links in with others, uh, essentially about managing expectations and risks. Um, what is very unclear is what Japan wants of its partners, the roles and duties, and what Japan imagines of itself. Japan wants to have the sense of community and kinship and support of partners and possibly their assistance in times of crisis. But it doesn't want to be uh, called upon to engage in any activities it doesn't wish to. Therefore, it rather wants it to be one-sided if it can possibly get away with it without actually saying that. Both government and society have extreme risk-averse qualities and the awareness and acceptance of risk is limited, I would suggest. And Japan is essentially just getting used to the concept of living with China and living with Russia. But the living with China-Russia thing is very different for European powers, who first have to live with Russia and then China. This is something that Japan hasn't quite appreciated that the visits of the British or the French to the region and their mini bases do not constitute the same degree of commitment that they have to Ukraine. And Japan hasn't quite worked out how to get its partners to show more commitment if indeed that's what it wants, which it seems to. So visions for the future. Uh, it could well be that there is a cutting and pasting of policies, looking at strategic uh, options, uh, envisaging real uh, likelihood for conflict, that seems to be increasing, particularly with Taiwan. Creating, this is something that I think that, this is something that the Japanese are not saying, but this is something that I believe is the case, that Japan is attempting to create or cultivate an intra and extra regional ecumen an ideational community, an ecumenical approach, which is essentially a gathering of common values, a gathering of the like-minded, a gathering of the ecumen originally uh, is essentially looking at the gathering of, of the civilized, and we don't like to use that expression, but a gathering of similar concepts of what is civilized society, what is civil governance? This is what I believe that Japan is trying to do, to have a gathering, a sense of community without a specific purpose other than to reassure, as a form of reassurance. Um, but Japan isn't stating that clearly. This may come later, I don't know. But very much, this is a sense of Japan realizing its position, its strategic options are not great and its reliance upon the US alliance continues, but as Paul Midford wrote in 2018, there may be a sense of decentering from the US. Not that that makes the US less important, but Japan also wants more reassurance, a sense that it doesn't want to be left with only one option. 
which is a form of strategic flex flexible hedging. So we come uh, back to the con we come to the conclusion, which is a reminder of the scattergun approach to uh, the research questions, which you should never do. Uh, but the conclusion is essentially the the Fort Vision is a counterpart to the BRI, but is not an equivalent or balancing counterweight. It has geopolitical aspects, but it isn't just about that sense of balancing China. It is an opportunistic operational, I, I can almost say it, operationalization of long-held values vital to safety and security. So uh, essentially the umbrella, but that's no bad thing because these values of, for example, free and open navigation, that's the basis upon what made Japan prosperous after the Second World War. The FOIP aim is to consolidate extant regional and global institutional architecture, reinforce rules-based international order, oceans governance, transparency as vital aspects of this global order it wishes to see. There is a limited Japanese-ness. Japan is limiting its own Japanese-ness to the global audience welcoming partner contributions with the many roads to FOIP approach. Uh, we could, I'm sorry for the, uh, the FOIP WTO CPTPP UNCLOS based minimalism. <laughs> oh, it slips off the tongue so easily. That is appealing to many states because if you talk about WTO, people, oh, okay, CPTPP, oh, sounds okay, UNCLOS, yeah, okay, fine. It's difficult to argue against this. Uh, but also there's, a low level, a low intensity sort of, I, you know, rules-based international order, functional engagement, activism, trying to insert adherence to international law within all of this. Now, Japan has obviously adopted a conceptual vagueness, a flexibility to allow it to do many different things under this banner of the FOIP. But this is a quote from, uh, sorry, it's half the quotation is missing, uh, the mark is missing. Tactical hedging soars doubt and may deplete Japanese long-term credibility. That's a quote from Koga. So the longer you are vague, the less advantage you derive from your vagueness. You want to retain the flexibility, but at some point you actually have to state, what do you want? What's your aim? Uh, FORP is a rhetorical device and a rallying point, so it is the umbrella, essentially. But it's also very difficult for anyone to oppose anything which is free and open. It's easy to rally forms of support around that banner. And there are some recommendations there which people can take up or ignore as they see fit. So I should probably end there because I've been talking far too long. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much for a fantastic talk. We've got lots of people in the audience, and I'm sure there'll be lots of questions uh, and comments from many different angles. So I'll just ask one kind of very basic, although somewhat broad question, which is that it strikes me that there's a critical juncture in a very particular span of years between about, let's say, 2007 and 2012, in that five-year period, in which thinking in Japan, or at least rhetoric in Japan, the articulation of that thinking, shifts markedly with regard to China. Yep. Um, away from saying, oh, we need to engage China constructively to now we need to confront China or at least think of China as a potential threat. Yep. Um, interestingly, a similar shift takes place almost exactly five years later, I would say, in North America and Europe. Yep. So the question to me about the shift in Japan is, what drove it? Okay. Is it Japanese domestic politics um, shifts between different governments mm -hmm. uh, or, or different factions in the LDP? Is it something China did? Is it a very specific incident? Is, is it just a gradual evolution that's harder to explain uh, that takes place maybe due to a multiplicity of factors? Um, so, so if you can speak just to that for a moment, mm -hmm. um, and then we'll open the floor up to, to lots of questions. Sure. Great question, Bill. Um, what I would say is I would agree with you that these sort of hinge times, mm. it isn't just one point, but it, I, I would say that what occurred, uh, obviously there's increasing concern, there was increasing concern regarding defense spending mm. uh, of China. 
Um, but where it affected Japan, I think 2010 would be the key point. Mm. Because in 2010, 2009, you had a, a DPJ government, Democratic Party of Japan, coming in until 2012. And if the actions had occurred during an LDP, the Chinese actions had occurred during an LDP administration, I think there would have been criticism from the opposition mm -hmm. to a great degree. But what happened was that uh, essentially 2010, a allegedly drunken Chinese fishing boat captain rammed two uh, Japan Coast Guard vessels because he was being detained for fishing illegally. And this escalated with uh, the Chinese government suddenly slowing the export of rare earths, these uh, vital uh, core elements, really for the electronic industry, yeah. uh, battery pr production, things like that. So Japan was facing this really quite complex threat, which was, okay, can we actually control our maritime space, our territorial integrity? If we try to do that, will our prosperity be directly threatened by economic conflict? And therefore, how do we manage this situation? And it was a very messy political situation, but the strategic starkness of it was a real shock to the DPJ government and to wider Japanese society, because most people never heard of rare earths or knew that they came from China. Mm. Um, so what you had from that point onwards was an unusual degree of harmony on China policy between the DPJ and the LDP. Yeah. So when Abe came in, and most of us had the, uh, most people had the vision of Abe as a very right-wing, hard, somewhat unpleasant character who was, you know, ready to revive the Japanese empire. But his approach was very similar to his DPJ predecessors, such as Naoto Kan and uh, Noda. So, and the same happened with defense spending and defense policies. So the proposals of the DPJ were just taken on by the LDP and continued. So this continued until 2015, when you had the new security right. laws. And again, it was the utter incompetence of the government to explain to the wider population why this was necessary. All you had to do was link the dots and it'd be quite easy mm. to do. So why they actually pulled back from saying this is about China? when clearly it was about China. Mm. That's the great mystery to me. Um, and I, I still don't have a, a sufficient answer for that. But honestly, the people working in the National Security Secretariat, I met a couple of them, and they were pulling their hair out because they had to write public documents to explain why these legal changes were required. And you had people marching in the streets, demonstrating against yeah. what they were proposing. Mm. Although the public sentiment also does seem to have shifted yes. over a little bit of a lag. It's lagged. Then. Yeah. Uh, somewhat like the say, Western, yeah. you know, European, North American lag yeah. from Japan. Uh, if you look at later developments, obviously President Xi, mm. um, the increasing authoritarian approach. And as we saw in Taiwan, the crushing of dissent in Hong Kong had a major effect upon souring people's perceptions of China as... Yeah a society that was governed by laws. Indeed. John. Darren, thanks for a, a brilliant talk which covered so many different aspects. Can I be intentionally provocative and test a theory on you? Sure. Um, because I think you've captured the ambiguity of all, and, and the sort of the lack of clarity in so many of these different initiatives. And I want to start by saying maybe part of the reason we're seeing this massive increase in defense expenditure is because there's been a comparable massive increase in risk, uncertainty, and above all, a lack of trust on the part of Japan's defense and security planners. So on the one hand, a lack of trust about the safety of their own immediate environment. On the other hand, and perhaps very fundamentally, a profound increase in distrust in the United States, 
So in a way, the proximate agent of change has been Donald Trump. Yeah. Mm -hmm. With all of the concerns about the reliability of the US-Japan alliance. Um, and as part of that, one sort of small element in the new national security strategy, which is sort of buried in the middle, is a reference to autonomy. Yeah. The idea that Japan should be, in principle, by 2027, on the way to being able to defend itself without having to rely on its traditional alliance on the United States. So, in a way, far from sort of wishing or be feeling equipped to reinforce the Pax Americana, the government is actually starting to think the unthinkable. What if we have to defend ourselves alone? Mm. So you've got that uncertainty and distrust about the international environment. You've also, notwithstanding what Bill was saying about a kind of gradual incremental tilt in public opinion towards acceptance of this defense spending, still a profound distrust on the part of government that public opinion will support some of these changes, which is why they have to be presented in this vague, values-based, principled support for democracy and values. Mm. Um, I was at a recent conference this weekend in, involving Japanese and British officials, and there was a Japanese journalist who was present who, to protect his anonymity, I won't reference him, but he talked about, you mentioned joining the dots. He argued that one of the ways we could think about Japan's defense policy is to think of it almost like a, an impressionistic, pointless painting. That the dots aren't actually joined up. There are a multitude of dots, some of which you've given us here today. Um, and that, that comes from this unwillingness to really come up with a response to this much more complex environment. And one of the clearest expressions of that is the one you focused on, which is the budget, yeah. how you pay for this. Because it's not just taxation or reclassifying what counts as defense spending. There's also been this massive increase in government debt allocations, yeah. which my understanding is that this is historically unprecedented, which is creating a lot of anxiety. But that's almost essential because if you start to actually identify taxation for this, you split the party, you split the LDP, and you create a massive backlash from public opinion. So I wonder if you can say something about this idea of autonomy yeah. and distrust. Yeah, I mean, it goes back to about 1995. There were um, increased calls for Japan to adopt what you might call a, a gaullist approach, uh, you know, an independent a, a sense of uh, self-defense capacity. And interestingly, if you talk to uh, senior JSDF officers, they say that Japan reached a form of level of self-defense capacity in about 1989-1990, just the end of the Cold War. Um, the problem that you get is that the nature of the threat has changed. Because no longer is it the, the nature of the threat is like to contain the Soviet fleet or, or to prevent an invasion of Hokkaido. As difficult as that was to work, it was relatively simple compared to the Southwest Islands and operating at great distances in the East China Sea. Um, I think this sense of autonomy the Japanese are talking about is not just the actual ability to defend itself against any threat. It's the ability to make the decisions on its own defense. So it's not actual about, actually about capacity because Japan, regardless of whether they spend twice as much on defense or three times as much on defense, with their manpower limitations, they will simply not be able, I, I don't believe, to secure themselves if China were determined. And particularly if Japan was to be in any way involved in Taiwan. I gave a presentation last year to the uh, Australian uh, Defence College and I gave different scenarios of how Japan could be involved in the Taiwan conflict from the minimal logistic basing elements right up to not being involved in a land war in, in, in Taiwan, but providing uh, elements to uh, US naval task forces. Well, if Japan was to do that, Japan would be very quickly losing people and assets. And it doesn't have the regeneration capacity. So if you don't have the regeneration capacity, it's got very low ammunition stores, 
um, how are you going to sustain a conflict? So how are you going to defend yourself? All Japanese defense planning has been, and it seems to be, will continue to be predicated upon the Americans coming to help. This idea of having full defense autonomy is a pipe dream. It, it may play out nicely to the right wing of the LDP, but I, I don't see it having any traction at all. And you, quite rightly, we've talked about this, highlighting the issue of the budget. Um, selling assets to appear to an increased defense budget. Okay, but what happens when you've used that money up? You've got the largest debt load in the world and you're going to increase it and most of the equipment you're going to buy is going to be from overseas. So how is this sustainable? And with the depletion of young people. Um, they may get people like my age to join the GSDF, you know. <laughs> By the way, John, you did actually miss out one very important reason why Japan policy changed this year. They obviously read my book. <laughs> so, yeah. That was a joke, by the way. It's not my arrogance. It, you know. Yes. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, so I would just like to ask a question about like China's uh, recently shifting foreign policy and its implications in Japan's FOIP. So some observers would call the new tone like soft and reconciliatory. That's what I've read um, in different articles recently. So do you think that Japan's FOIP strategy would change with this like new, like recent new policy, at least like what I've seen at, towards the end of 2022, yeah. would mean that there's going to be less of the realist response that you highlighted? Okay. Or would you mean that, or would it mean that Japan would hedge more because it's more uncertain now? All right, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I don't think it would soften because China has temporarily softened. You know, China changes its tone dramatically. China rarely picks an argument with two or three countries at the same time. It tends to, you know, husband its resources rather well, I would say. Um, and quite frankly, Japan is not the main problem for, for China. It really isn't. It's always going to be the US. Um, and immediately in its region, there are other countries it wants to deal with uh, as a priority. But Japan remains important. I think Japan's hedging Hedging, let's say flexibly engaging. Uh, flexibly, we both know what we mean. Um, flexibly engaging with China because we also mustn't, I feel very strongly, we mustn't demonize all of China, the block that we call China, because there are very much elements of China that Japan can do business with, literally as business. But also there are parts of public policy where Japan and China have common concerns. Uh, maritime safety is one. Environmental protection. Environmental protection. This is where cooperation continues. Counter-piracy. Pandemic measures. Um, the, their approaches have been different, mm. but in the but future... But they've actually cooperated yeah. as well. Yeah. Yeah. So there are areas of cooperation, technical, human, educational. There are various areas of, of potential cooperation. You can cooperate with anyone in a certain realm, including with North Korea. It's mm. possible to cooperate if you try hard enough. But it's clearly difficult to co cooperate with a country which has someone like President Xi at the helm, who very much wants to control so much. So the areas of the opportunities for cooperation are maybe more limited now, but they still do exist. So yes, flexibly engaging is potentially going to be greater, yeah. Um, thank you very much for the uh, wonderful talk. I have two questions. Uh, one question is about the, uh, the concept of FOIP. It right. uh, means a free and open vision for international society. Um, I wonder how do we make sense of the idea of free and open? So for example, where do you place South Korea? Japan's relationship of South, with South Korea in this, the, in this free and open international relationship. So this is my first question. And second question is really uh, about your methodology because in this uh, presentation, you talk about Japan a lot. So I wonder how Japan thinks because Japan is a country, is a nation state. 
right? So how do we understand Japan thinks? Yeah. So you mentioned the foreign ministries, but are these foreign ministries really representing Japan, or the civic society, or or the the bureaucracy? So who is speaking, or who is thinking on behalf of Japan? Yeah, I mean, Thank thanks, thanks, Jin. That's great. That that links in with the, the the previous question. I mean, what we call China and what we call Japan, what do they actually represent? So. I wanted to show the different agencies and their different approaches, just to show the diversity within Japan, but also the sense of harmony. Um, but when you talk about the concept of the FOIP, and is this actually representing Japan or my methodology? This is where it gets very vague even for me, because FOIP, the FOIP vision and statements on FOIP essentially embrace anything Japanese that is done within the region. That's the potential for it. So if Toyota happened to open up a new car dealership in Jakarta, oh, it's a, an achievement for FOIP. Is it? Okay. Right. Oh, fine. But really it isn't because that is just the normal pattern of trade that we would have. So I am struggling to deal with, in a methodological, in my methodology, I'm struggling to deal with the folk concept. I really am, the folk vision, because I honestly am not altogether sure what it is meant to be and what it actually is at any given time in any given realm. And that is what makes it an interesting subject. Because you struggle to, you, you do struggle to define it and to identify it. It's okay conceptually, but in functional operation. And about North, uh, South Korea, sorry. South Korea, I'm sorry, my previous uh, presentation I made at uh, Fames, mm. I keep banging on about the same point. South Korea and engagement with civil society in Japan are the two blind spots of Japan's policy on pretty much anything. Mm. When it comes to maritime safety and security, why aren't they cooperating with Korea? Openly, clearly engaging with Korea. They have common interests. Japan's FOWIP vision very clearly states engagement with lots of countries in Southeast Asia, barely mentions South Korea. It's a blind spot. I hope with the new Korean government this will change, but if it does, you know with the next Korean government it will probably change back. So until Japan essentially deals with its problem with Korea, this will not change. But for Japan to deal with its problem with Korea re requires a complete change of mindset about what that entails. For example, the agreement that um, Prime Minister Abe signed with President Pak on comfort women, that was seen by the Koreans as the start of a process and by the Japanese as the end of a process. Mm -hmm. They were at absolute opposite ends, negotiating, talking, coming to an agreement, and neither of them seemed to appreciate what the other was doing. Maybe they just did this like, okay, this is good enough for now. I don't know, but it's the inability of Japanese governments to essentially engage with Korea is one of the most depressing aspects of covering Japanese policy. One thing that's interesting about that, just as a quick aside, and then we'll take some more questions, but if FOIP is hard to define positively, yes, in other words, that it covers anything that Japan does is, is good for FOIP, how do we define it negatively? Is anything that China does inherently, that's not FOIP kind of thing? Oh, yeah, or is yeah. That, <laughs> well, this or is, or the... is it anything Japan doesn't like that anybody does? or is it? Well, you see, this is it. I mean, anything that's seen as uh, against UNCLOS or mm. international law or against the prevailing norms and standards or the post-war status quo, oh, well, that's not in line with FOIP. But Japan's artificial island isn't out of line with FOIP, even though China's are. Well, no, it's Japanese. And, yeah, it's, <laughs> so, and it's not an island. Right. It's, it's a, the thing is, it's so yeah. modest and rusty and old and terrible. You know, it's like they, sea land. 
Yes, it's like, sense, yeah. that's right, the independent kingdom of yeah. Sealand. Um, so maybe it's not worthy of the ire. But uh, yeah, this is the one thing. But then again, if Japan was to give that up and to recognize they don't have an EEZ, mm. that's a huge area where they can't manage fisheries and resources, right. particularly because there are supposed to be, uh, is it methyl hydrates? Uh, future energy mm. sources that they think are in that area. So. Why don't we now take a bank of two or three questions? Um, let's a start in the front and work back. We've got three hands on this side that I can see. Yeah. Okay, thank you for the presentation. Yeah. Actually, I conducted a research on this topic uh, in 2020. Well, I have uh, two short comments for you and a question for you. Yeah. Uh, my first comment is about what you have said, China was silent with Japan's FOIP. Actually, at least after Nikai Toshi Toshihiro visited China in 2017, uh, the third party market cooperation became popular in China. And until 2020, uh, it was regarded by Chinese scholars and diplomats as an important way to cooperate between Japan's FOIP and China's BRI. Yeah. And the se second comment is that uh, the geopolitical aspects of the FOIP vision you mentioned I think it seems more likely to be reflected in Japan's defense strategy and its quad security cooperation with uh, United States, India, and Australia. And according to the description of the Japanese government uh, of these ministries, uh, the quad and the FOIP have some intersections but are not the same, I think. Yeah. And my question is, do you think considering Japan's FOIP merely as a geopolitical strategy ignores the other aspects of this strategy? Well, I found that among some studies of the uh, Japan's FOIP in 2017 to 2020, some scholars used the term geoeconomic strategy. Well, I, I have also started this issue and I found that uh, they, they think uh, geoeconomic strategy emphasized openness and the possibility of cooperating with a variety of different countries if certain conditions are met. But geopolitical strategy will only compete and confront countries that are perceived as a threat or potential threat. Uh -huh. So uh, for a long time, I think Japan's FOIP did not exclude cooperation with competitors or even imaginary enemies such as Russia and China. For example, in the two plus two ministerial dialogue with Russia, uh, they also mentioned, they, they talked about the cooperation on FOIP. And with China, they, have the, they had the third party market cooperation. So I also noticed the use of the vision, this word, instead of the word strategy yeah. in Japan's FOIP is to some extent intended to ally the geopolitical concerns of the Asian countries. So I think Japan's FOIP uh, vision have uh, some aspects other than the geopolitical aspects you mentioned. So do you think uh, these other aspects should also be uh, emphasized or uh, paid, paid attention to? Okay. Thank you. Okay, great. We'll just take the other yeah. two questions quickly. And if I could ask everybody to be as brief and succinct as possible. <laughs> Grotius was on one of the last slides. He would remind us the clock is ticking. <laughs> I think if you're talk, but just very briefly, we can talk a little bit more about Southeast Asia or ASEAN in this FOIP. What's interesting about, you know, going back to conflicts with the two seas is that very clearly geographically ASEAN is at the center of this, but they have their own vision, right? I mean, they have yeah. this idea of ASEAN centrality. They have the ASEAN regional forum, which predates FOIP. And, you know, that has almost like equidistant partnerships. So, you know, where does that, you know, where's kind of the Southeast Asian agency, if you will, within this larger vision? Sure, thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. This has been a really interesting talk. I just kind of want to touch on actually two of the main points you brought up, mainly its use as a cover all policy umbrella. When I look at similar policy umbrellas like the BRI, it kind of ties into a sense of Chinese nationalism and a win for the BRI is a win for China. Yeah. Whereas you said yourself, like policy success is a win for FOIP, it's not a win for Japan. So what restricts the sense of Japanese-ness from entering FOIP? Is that because of a, like a fear of Japanese nationalism and how it might be perceived? And then in follow-up to that, can you have a non-nationalist national security doctrine? Yeah, great. Nice questions. Okay. Where to start? Yes, no, maybe, possibly. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's usually the answer. That's usually the answer that covers everything. Um, so, first question. Uh, absolutely, I would agree with you. Uh, geoeconomic is much easier to cultivate cooperation than geopolitical. I focus more on the geopolitical today for one reason and one reason alone. 
because I was invited to give a talk <laughs> for the Center for Geopolitics. <laughs> if I was invited by the Center of Geoeconomics, I would give a talk which focused on that. Um, but yes, uh, one thing I would say that is there is a natural fit there that geoeconomics is about cooperation because it's about trade. Essentially, it's about integration of trade and uh, facilitating trade. Geopolitics has more of a competitive edge, yes. But geopolitics also includes diplomacy. And diplomacy, by its nature, is about negotiating and communicating with others. So, yes, there is a greater competitive element in there, but that's not the sole element. Geopolitics equals aggressive competition is not the equation here. So I, I would urge some caution on that. And, and you are right to highlight the areas uh, of potential cooperation, uh, 2017, 2020, China, Japan, that there are significant... I keep emphasizing there are areas where Japan and China can cooperate with or without the FOIP. They can cooperate. But China's government doesn't tend to recognize the forward vision as something worthy. And China generally, it, it, correct me, Bill, but China, I don't think, tends to use the Indo-Pacific term. No. It tends to use Asia, Asia-Pacific. Mm. It tries to avoid Indo-Pacific. It regards that conceptually as a non-Chinese concept or a concept China doesn't yet wish to engage with. That's how it seems. From China's point of view, there's two very distinct regions in the east and in the west, basically, of, yeah. of China. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then looking at ASEAN, um, I think that many countries, Japan included, their frustration with ASEAN is that it's difficult to get ASEAN to commit to anything. ASEAN, the institution. ASEAN states will, but ASEAN, the institution, is difficult to get. Them. So ARF is a good example. I mean, Japan was instrumental in yes. establishing ARF. Um, but the fact that Japan has very much placed Southeast Asia and ASEAN at the absolute core, the central axis of everything to do with the FOIP, uh, really is... I think a recognition that this is where the future of Asia's geoeconomic prosperity will be coming from. Uh, and where you have geoeconomy, you have geopolitics following close behind. So there's already geopolitical competition in this area, and it could turn kinetic. Um, some would argue it has already, but this is. This is an area of great instability generally, uh, despite ASEAN existing. Um, and where you have a one country claiming that essentially most of the South China Sea belongs to them and should be controlled by them, and they wish to ring it with their own little military bases, it's not, it's not a good position to be in. So Japan actually targeting Southeast Asia is a recognition of the geoeconomics, but also of the great geopolitical challenges to come. So I think, again, my sense is they want to gather a community to collectively address these challenges of the future. That's my guess. But since Japan isn't actually vocalizing this or in, to any great degree, it's difficult to tell. Now, the, the next two questions. Um, I think they're very good questions indeed about the, 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 the BRI and it's like the, the victory for BRI is a victory for China. But how do you do the same when you remove the Japan element? When I say Japan removes, I say Japan reduces the Japan element. It does say, you know, clearly the more for home page, you know, these are achievements of Japan's FOIP. Great. But then on the other side, they're saying there are many roads to FOIP. We wish other countries to engage with their own visions. I think that very much Japan was worried that if you had something which was seen as national, unilateral, it would be seen as a competition with China. And if you're going to compete with China, you better have an awful lot of money. Uh, and obviously Japan can't do that. So it's better to have a lower key approach, a less nationalistic approach, have more multilateral. Japan comes in quickly with the vision, the, you know, the initially strategy, then very quickly changed to a vision. 
based upon norms, laws, values. Again, a platform that many parties would find easy to engage with. You give it a title free and open, difficult not to engage with, certainly difficult to oppose. Um, and then that makes it easier for others to join, even if they are joining the BRI. These are not mutually exclusive. As I said, because the fort can cover everything, it can also cover things on the, on the fringes of the edges of the BRI. Um, and actually, Prime Minister Abe did actually uh, flirt at some moments about joining in projects with China, which were BRI labeled. Mm. So these are not mutually exclusive, but the, the, their approaches are very different, yes. Even though both are essentially catch-all umbrellas. Um, so, yeah. Fantastic. I think we're pretty much out of our allocated time. So I think let's end the formal program here. If people have remaining questions or comments, please do come forward afterwards. Uh, I will stay for a while, I think, uh, for Garen can chat with, with you uh, at least briefly. But for now, thank you very much. Thank you for a fantastic no, talk. And thank for you. a great question, sir. Thank you. And by the way, I didn't, I normally, at the end of the slide, I have a picture of my book and where you can buy it. And I didn't do that. I, it's most remiss of me, but... Uh...